So one of the things we do here, uh, if it's an evening of music, we always have at least one poem because my wife Dallas is a, a violinist. If it's a night of poetry, Dallas always plays at least one musical piece. And then when we have story, as we've had with Walton and Leslie in the past, we kind of have story and a little poem and a little music. So I wanted to keep that tonight. We've got music, poetry, and story. <clears throat> I will read three short poems right before we go on to the story. Uh, many of our friends out there, many of you have, have fallen in love with poetry as I have. It's, it's a part of our community, it's a part of our lives now. Uh, I've been working at it for almost 45 years. I can't let it go. And that's one reason why we started the Como Salon series so that I could invite the poets I like to hear into my living room. Today you're in my living room with, and I'm in your living room. This is a strange thing. This is so strange to be in everybody else's room. But we're gonna, we're, we're gonna have fun tonight. I wanna start with uh, three short poems. And since we're doing fairy tale, folk tale stories, or Walton and Leslie are telling a fairy tale, I thought I would do three short stories or three short poems on that theme. So this is a, a, a poem called The Middle Moment. Did you hear of the enchantress who thought her lover unfaithful? She transformed him into a small field of poppies. If I were quick enough, would I, would I have seen that middle moment when he was half flower and half flesh? Could I have seen the life cord connecting his brain, his spine, his roots, his stems, and his heart-shaped blossoms? As we know, stories and poetry and music cross multiple dimensions. Here's another one. There's a flower that grows so fast and decays so soon, you could never pick it or display it or dry it in a book. It lives so swiftly that it's never seen by our clumsy eyes. Glenn, you don't believe me? You believe that expert who says that elephants talk so low that their sound is beyond our hearing. Glenn, let's go look for flowers, just you and me. And one more, I can go seek. A woodland fairy will always win a game of hide and go seek. She naturally knows how to use shadows, leaves, and the rays of the sun. I've heard that there are folks who are still looking for the fairy champion of 1491. <laughs> so, you never know what's gonna happen. There are patterns as we study poetry, as we listen to stories, as we listen to music. And those patterns, we, are, we don't know where those patterns are gonna take us. So tonight as we listen to the story, maybe there'll be an image that drops in. Maybe there will be a phrase from the song Maybe there'll be uh, something in the poem, uh, just a line or two, uh, uh, something that drops into our lives. And we never know where it's gonna go. And I just wanted to say, to give a simple example of that. 56 years ago on June 12th, 1964, 
there was a concert at the Excelsior Dance Land Ballroom. And there was a rock group there, but they didn't, they were disappointed because so few people showed up. The next day, June 13th, the lead singer had to get a prescription filled. And so he went to the Excelsior drugstore. And in the drugstore, he met Excelsior's ambassador, the town ambassador. You know, the, the kind of fella, every small town has one. He's a bit challenged and he wears his name tag. And he talked to the lead singer and he said, you know, I just ordered a cherry Coke and they just gave me a Coke. You know, you can't always get what you want. And he walked out. As you know, five years later, there was a song, you can't always get what you want. But if you try, sometimes you'll find you get what you need. Mick Jagger was that lead singer in Excelsior. And that song, in my case, it's unfortunate that it will be played tonight for 19,000 people in Oklahoma City. It's been a theme song. Those words, which meant so much to Mr. Jimmy, have been around the world many times and those words have been misused. So we don't know where our words are gonna go. We don't know where a story will take us. We don't know how a poem will move us. We don't know how we will ride the next song into the other place where we're going. And I think that other place is where Brian and Madeline are about to take us. Du warst das Wasser weiß, alle Flüsse munden ins Meer. Ich bin der Fluss und das Meer. Weißt du, was das Wasser weiß? Alle Flüsse munden ins Meer. Ich bin der Fluss und das Meer. This story happened long ago. In a time that is not our time. In that time, in that time, there were some people who forgot the reciprocal nature of the relationship between human beings and the world around us. In that time, there were some people that forgot that they were related to the stones and the trees and the winds and the waters. Once in that time, once around that time, once behind that time, once beside that time, once upon that time, there was a miller. Now, of course, being a miller, he had a mill. He had a, a mill wheel and a mill pond, and grinding stones, and he ground the wheat and the barley and the rye for the people of his region. And the miller was fairly successful. He made a good living doing this, trading grain and flour made so much money, in fact, that he and his wife were able to buy a nice piece of land not too far from the mill. And on that piece of land, they built a lovely big house. And they even had enough money to hire a few servants to do some of the chores around the place. And the story might end there, but it wouldn't be very interesting if it did. Well, after a time, the nature of things changed, just as the, 
The moon changes phases and the, the tides have their neap and their flood. So too, fortunes and the finances of people can change. And after a time, the miller found that that other current, that current of currency, began to roll out much faster than it was rolling in. And he found that he was in danger of losing all that he had worked for. They say it comes when you least expect it arrives in the middle of the night. One day you're sitting on top of the world, the next you've lost your life. Fortune is a fickle one, luck is a lady of the night. With a blink or a shudder, she'll pull you under and laugh upon your plight. Well, his business dealings troubled the miller's sleep. And it got to be where he would lay in bed, staring into the dark, trying to will himself to sleep, but being unable to do so. Perhaps some of you have experienced this kind of insomnia. And one night, he was laying in that way, trying to sleep and failing. And finally, just as the first streaks of light were brightening the eastern sky, he decided to give it up, to go out and take a walk and to clear his head. And so he got dressed and he pulled on his boots and he just went out and started walking where his feet would take him. And perhaps just out of habit, his feet took him down to the mill. And he walked out over on the dam on, on next to the mill pond and he stood there. He stood there thinking about his business problems. Just at that that middle time between night and day. He was standing there, lost in thought, when suddenly he heard something in the water. And he turned and looked to see what it was. And there, rising out of the mill pond, was a woman. A beautiful woman rising up out of the pond until she was standing on the surface of the water, her long hair cascading down off her head like a waterfall breaking upon the rocks of her hands. Did I say she was a woman? Not quite true. She was a spirit. She was the Nixie of the pond. The miller stood there, terrified. Every part of him wanted to run, but something about the Nixie's eye held him frozen in that place. But at last, the Nixie smiled at him and looked in a not unkind way. And his anxiety began to diminish. And then the Nixie spoke. And she asked him what brought him to that place at such an early hour. And the miller decided to pour his heart out to her. And he told her of his business problems and how he was in danger of losing everything. And how his luck had all gone bad. The Nixie listened, and then she said, Is that all? Well, she said, I can change your fortune. I can make it so that you are more prosperous than ever before. But you must do something for me in return. What's that, said the Nixie. 
also the next thing. You must give me the next thing born to your household. You must sacrifice it to the pond and give it to me. Miller thought for a moment. He knew he, he, he being a miller and having a lot of grain around, he kept cats so they would keep the mice at bay, and, and the cats were always having litters of kittens. And he had some dogs back at his place, and they were having litters of puppies now and again, and so he assumed it would be a kitten or a puppy. And he thought he would gladly sacrifice one of those to the pond for a change in his fortune. So he agreed to the bargain, and they sealed the deal, and the Nixie slipped back beneath the waters of the pond. And the miller ran home excitedly to tell his wife of the amazing thing that had occurred, the vision he'd seen at the pond and the, the bargain he'd made. And as he ran up to his house, running out to meet him was the servant girl. And she said, Master, great news! Your wife is delivered of a son. Master, you are a father. Congratulations! And the miller's heart sunk for he knew the Nixie had tricked him into making a very bad bargain indeed. And the miller went in to see his wife and to hold his newborn son. And when he got up the courage, he told her what had happened, of the terrible bargain he'd made with the Nixie. And they talked it over and they decided, what they decided to do was this, they decided that they would never allow their son anywhere near the mill pond. They would never allow the boy to follow his father to work at the mill. They would n keep him away from the pond at all costs. And that's what they did. And when the boy grew a little older, both his parents would continually tell him, never, never follow your father to work, never go near the mill pond. If you go near that pond, a hand will reach out of the pond and pull you under. And as you can imagine, you tell a small child this. You, his parents, tell him this continually. Well, he's inclined to believe you. So the boy never went anywhere near the pond, never followed his father. In fact, when he got old enough to go out and play, he would go in the opposite direction from the mill. He would go out into the woods, and he would climb trees and play with sticks and climb around on the rocks and watch the birds and the animals. And that's how he occupied himself. <clears throat> now, for her part, the Nixie kept her part of the bargain. The miller became more and more prosperous. All of his business ideas just seemed to work out magically. And he kept making money hand over fist. In fact, it seemed as if his coffers of money just filled themselves overnight while he slept. This went on for years. The boy grew older, the miller grew richer. He began to wonder if the thing with the Nixie was just something he'd imagined, but still, still they kept the boy away from the pond. One day the boy was out playing in the woods as always, and he came upon the royal huntsman, the, the huntsman of the king, out there doing his business. And being a boy, and the huntsman having a bow and arrow, and a big knife, the boy naturally tagged along with the older man. And the huntsman was kind of glad for the company out in the woods, and he began to talk with the boy. And day after day, he started teaching him about hunting, and about the woods, and about the habits of animals, and what season you hunted which animal, and where they went for water, and what they ate, and where, how they made it, and, and how they moved across the land. And, how to read the signs. He taught him all these things. And when the boy was old enough, the huntsman went to the miller, his father, and he proposed that the boy officially become the apprentice huntsman. Now, this was a step up the social ladder to enter into royal service with the son of a miller. And so, the miller agreed, and the boy officially became the apprentice to the royal huntsman, and he began spending all his days in the forest learning the trade of hunting. He learned to shoot the bow. He learned how to skin out the animals, and how to dress the hides, and all the things that were needed for a royal huntsman. This went on for years. Finally, the, the boy, of course, grew to manhood. 
and he became not the apprentice, but the assistant huntsman. And he was quite a handsome boy. And you know, being the royal huntsman, he dressed in buckskins, and he had a green cape, and he wore the royal insignia, and he had his bow and his quiver slung over his shoulder, and he cut quite the dashing figure. And one day, the huntsman was in the village, in the village square, and there he locked eyes with a young village maiden. He wanted to look away, but he couldn't. And finally he did, but he had to look back. And it was as if they were both thunderstruck. And looking led to conversation. Conversation led to courting. Eventually, the young huntsman bought a silver locket for the young village maid. Courting led to love, and love eventually led to a marriage. Some time after the marriage of the huntsman and the village maid, the old huntsman decided it was time to retire. And so he took his pension and moved on. And the young huntsman became the official huntsman to of the king. And as such, he was given the hunting lodge that he and his wife could move into as their home. And they lived in a beautiful place there in the forest and the story might end there, but of course it doesn't. For one day, the king decided that he would hold a feast, and he decided he wanted to serve venison at this feast, and so he gave an order that his huntsman should go and hunt a deer. Now the huntsman went out into the place in the forest where he thought the deer might pass, and he set himself up there with his bow, his arrow knocked, and he waited hardly breathing, still in body and mind he waited, and eventually a deer did present itself. He had a clear shot, and he took the shot, and he hit the deer, but the deer didn't go down. It was wounded, but it didn't go down. It ran, as they sometimes do, and so the huntsman began to track the deer, following the sign of the deer, following the life's blood of the deer as it flowed out of the wound through the forest. The deer led him a long way. It was strong. It led him down into gullies and up hills and into a place of the forest he'd never visited before. But after a long while of walking, he came upon the place where the deer had fallen and breathed its last. And then the huntsman took off his bow and his quiver, and he took off his green cape, and he rolled up his sleeves and pulled out his hunting knife, and he began the process of field dressing the deer. He slid open the deer's belly and pulled out the lungs and the intestines and the offal. And if you've ever done this work, you know it's a bloody mess. And when he was done, field dressing the deer, his hands were covered in blood, and as he looked up, he saw that just beyond, there was a pond. Perhaps because the deer had led him on a twisting path to a strange part of the forest, and perhaps because he'd never visited that particular pond before, he didn't recognize that it was his father's mill pond. When dipped his bloody hands into the water, other hands reached up and pulled him under the water, and all went quiet. Well, back at the lodge, the young wife was standing in the doorway, watching the sun set in the west. 
And she was waiting for her husband and a little bit concerned because he had never come home this late from hunting before. <coughs> and so she distracted herself by going about her evening chores, making dinner, setting the table. But as the sun fully set and the sky began to darken and the half moon rose, her concern turned to worry. And I think you know probably how she felt when you worry, when your loved one doesn't come home and it's late and it's dark and they haven't called, you begin to do the what ifs. And she did as well. What if he fell from his horse and he broken a limb? What if a wild animal had attacked him and he lays bloody somewhere in the forest floor? What if? What if? And amidst those what ifs, she recalled a story that he had told her right after they were wed. A story about a bargain made with a Nixie and a debt unpaid. And her worry turned to fear. And she grabbed her shawl, threw it around her, and she took out through the woods with only the light of that half moon showing her the way through the forest. She walked for hours until she came to a clearing and there in the clearing she spotted the fell deer and beyond the deer the leather bag her husband always hunted with and beyond the bag the edge of a mill pond. And she ran to the edge of that pond, calling out for her husband, calling him by name. But he did not answer. And so the poor woman started to walk around the mill pond, crying out this time for the Nixie, begging her to return her husband to her, begging her to be kind and generous and give him back. But she was met with silence. And then she called out curses on that Nixie, curses for her cruelty and her heartlessness. Silence. The mill pond was still with only the half moon reflected in its surface. All night long, that poor woman walked around that mill pond, sometimes weeping, sometimes wailing, until exhausted, she fell to the earth, laid her head on the grassy bank, and she fell into a deep sleep and began to dream. dream, found herself climbing up a very rocky mountain. The thistles and the thorns were stinging her feet, and the roots of the tree had somehow found their way in and out of the rocky crevices, forming handholds that she would grab onto to pull herself up the steep of that mountain, her fingers bloody from trying to find the crevices in that mountain, and she kept pulling herself up, and then the sky opened up and rain fell down upon her so that her clothes stuck to her body, and then the wind began to rise up and swirl about her, her long black hair flying around her eyes, she could barely see but one foot in front of the next kept going until at last she pulled herself up on the top of that mountain. There, the rain subsided and the winds died down 
and the sun broke out and shone down on a meadow, a meadow that went down into a valley, a meadow filled with the most brilliant wildflowers she had ever seen, glistening golds, plum purples, indigo blues, those wildflowers so dense, they formed Followed that path down the end of that meadow, and there was a small hut with smoke curling out of the chimney, and the door slightly dark. So the young woman peeked into the cottage, and there, in front of a fire, was an ancient one sometimes called the crone, also known grandmother. And that old woman turned, looked at the young woman, opened her mouth to speak when the young woman woke up and she was lying by the pond. Dawn was breaking, but she knew she had been asleep for a very, very long time. She stood up and she found herself being able to breathe so freely and she knew in her gut what she needed to do. She needed to find that ancient woman. And so she set out through the woods, walking for days through those woods, and then over meadows and, and over hills, across streams and around the winding rivers, through the mountains, until at last she found herself staring at a mountain very like the one in her dream, and following the internal map of her dream, she made the way up that mountain finding the handholds, pulling herself up, rain coming, the wind coming, and she just kept going. So she came to the top of the mountain, and sure enough, the sun shone on a meadow, just like the one in her dream, and she followed it down to the hut, and the door was ajar to a little cottage, and she opened the door. And there, just like in her dream, sat Long white hair falling down over her bony shoulders, her shawl wrapped around her. The old woman turned and looked at the young girl, her cheeks creased with age and wisdom, her eyes as sharp and keen as they could be. And she turned to the young woman and said, Ah! My dear girl, you must be suffering a great misfortune to have sought out my lonely hut. Tell me, my girl, what is in your heart? And the young woman, when she heard those words, it was like her heart burst open. And she began to cry and weep out her story of her lost love, of a bargain and a collection of debt, and the Nixie in the pond who had taken her love. And she wept and cried until she had not a tear left in her. And the old woman offered her a cup of tea wiped the last tear from her cheek. She said, Be comforted, my girl, for I can help you. And then, from under her shawl, she took out a gold comb. And on the handle of that comb was etched into that gold the leaves of the trees, the vines of the woodlands, the flowers, the meadow. 
follow me my directions my girl absolutely perfectly wait until the moon is full once more then take this golden comb down to the pond's edge and comb your long black hair until it is as smooth as silk and place the comb at the pond's edge. Wait, watch what happens. Well, the young girl was so grateful for the help that she took off the silver locket that her husband had given her and she offered it to the old woman with her deep gratitude. And then she went back home, wait for the full moon. shining in the sky and the young woman took the gold comb and made her way back to the pond sat and combed out her long black hair and as she was instructed to do she laid the comb at this pond's edge and soon she heard some bubbling coming up from the bottom of that pond and then a small wave came and it swept the comb out into the pond. And in less time than it would take for that comb to sink to the bottom of that pond, some bubbling came up from the center of the pond and out of the bubbles two waves. And be between those waves, the head of her husband rose up out of the pond. And she called out to him, but he could only look longingly at her before another wave came and pushed him down into the depths of the pond. Well, the young woman was so distraught, she was so disappointed, she, she could do nothing but run home and throw herself into bed and cry herself to sleep. And that night, she dreamt again of the mountain and the climb and the meadow and the cottage and the door ajar. And so the next day, when she awoke, she followed that dream again. And she did exactly what she had done before. And when she reached the cottage door and saw it was ajar, she opened it up. And there again, as before, was the old ancient one who welcomed her in, gave her tea, asked her to tell her what had happened, and at the end said, My girl, I can help you. And then she took out from her shawl a golden flute. And engraved in the gold of that flute between the stops 
were the birds of the meadow, the songbirds of the forest. Wait until the moon is full once more, my girl, then take this flute, play your sweetest song. Then put the flute on the edge of the pond. Wait, watch what happens. And so the young woman did as she was told. She went back and again waited those many days. But while she waited, she practiced on that flute. So finally, one she played the most beautiful song. It just filled her heart with so much love. So when the moon was full, she went down to the pond. She saw a rock that was jutting out into the water, and she sat on that rock. She played her sweetest song. And when she was done, she did as she was told. She left the flute at the edge of the rock. Soon, a rushing sound came up out of that pond, and a larger wave came, and it swept the flute out into the waters. And again, a rushing sound came up from the middle of the pond, and this time, not just the head of her husband, but his torso came up, his arms reaching out to her. And just as she was about to reach to him, another wave came up and pushed him down into the water. And that young woman let out a howl and a wail so loud. It was so much grief. And she ran home and threw herself into bed and cried herself to sleep and again dreamt of the mountain. And so the next morning she set out for that mountain. And every step up that mountain, she got angrier and so fierce. And when she went down the meadow, she flew up to the cottage and she threw that door open. And when the old woman asked her to tell her what was in her heart, she let out every bit of her anger. What good is it? to see my husband for a moment and then lose him again. What good is it? That wise woman did what the ancient ones know how to do. She rested her hand on the young woman's shoulder. Just held it there while she ranted and raved and cried out until she was done. And then the old woman leaned into the young girl and said, the end is not yet, my girl. The end is not yet. And then she brought out a golden spinning wheel <coughs> with legs carved like the animals of the woodlands, the deer, the wolf, and the fox. And she said, take this spinning wheel to the edge of the pond on the next full moon. Spin until the thimble is full. And then, <coughs> wait, watch what happens. And so yet again, the young woman went home, waited the many long days until finally again, the moon was full. And she took that spinning wheel out to the edge of the pond. 
and she began to spin. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever spun flax into thread, but it takes a lot of patience to make that work. And it takes a balance between the tension and twisting of the thread and knowing when to let the flax go through your fingers. And so the young girl took the spinning down and she began to spin, 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 and spin. no more flax at her feet and that spindle was full of thread and then she stepped back from the spinning wheel and heard a roar coming up from the pond and a huge wave came up and it swept that spinning wheel out into the pond and then another roar came up from the center of the pond and this time the whole person of her husband came up and when his feet were right at the top of that pond surface he leapt out clasped her by the hands and they took off running because now the whole pond was coming up a huge wave coming and washing over the and coming for them to take them to the Nixie when she did the only thing she knew to do. She cried out, Grandmother! Just as the water, the torrent, wetted their heels, they were transformed. He into a frog, she into a toad, and then the wave washed over them, carrying them across the land. But because they'd been transformed into a frog and a toad, they were able to hold their breath long enough that they weren't drowned. But they were turned and twisted every which way in the torrent, washed along miles and went. Finally, after a long time, it came to a mountain, and there the flood split. Some of it went to the east of the mountain, some of it went to the west. The frog was swept one way, the toad was swept the other, down into the mountain valleys for miles it went. At long last, the flood subsided, and each of them transformed back into their human shape. But neither knew what had happened to the other, and each of them supposed their lover had drowned. And when they asked where they were, and they asked about their homeland and how to get back. No one in the new lands that they were in had ever even heard of their homeland, much less had any notion of how to tell them how to get back there. And so the huntsman, who had been the miller's son, decided that he would try to make a new life for himself and his grief and his loss. And he took up the work of tending sheep, of being a shepherd in that strange land. And far over on the other side of the mountains, in a different land, his wife, too, took up the occupation of being a shepherdess. So they spent the years following the herds, shearing the sheep, doing the work of shepherding. Still, in grief from the loss that they had suffered. And that's where the story might end. But one spring, the shepherd, who had been the huntsman, who had been the miller's son, heard that the pastures were especially rich up in the high mountain, high, high mountain pastures. And so he decided to take his sheep up there where he'd never led them before. He went up into the high mountain pastures. And when he got his sheep up there, he noticed there was another flock nearby. And so out of courtesy, he went to introduce himself to that shepherd. It was his wife. But so many years had gone by and so much grief had carved its way into their faces that neither of them recognized the other. 
Still, they were glad for the company, and they began to tend their flocks together that spring. And some, some night, it was near this time of year, near midsummer, there happened to be a full moon. And that night, the shepherd reached into his pocket, and he pulled out a golden flute that was carved with the figure of birds of the mountain meadows. And he began to play the very song that his wife had played all those years ago at the edge of the pond. When he was finished playing, he looked over and saw that the cheeks of the shepherdess were glistening with tears in the moonlight. And he laid down the flute and said, My friend, why are you weeping? The moon was full just like this one. The last time I played that song and saw the head of my dear wife come up out of the pond. And instantly the enchantment was broken. It was as if the scales had fallen from their eyes and they recognized one another and they fell into each other's arms and they poured out their hearts and told their whole story to each other. And I don't suppose I need to tell you that they lived, as they say, happily ever after. Now, of course, as they poured out their story, there were some doves that were roosting nearby, and they heard the whole story. And the story was carried by the doves for some generations of doves, and that's why the story has its mournful qualities. But one year, a magpie was raiding a dove's nest and was trying to lift the dove's egg, egg out, but it dropped it down into a stream below, and the egg broke on a rock, and, it might, and the story might have been lost there, but some trout ate that egg yet. And the story was picked up by the trout people who carried it downstream and back up. And that's why the story flows elegantly, like a trout swimming through a stream. And it might have stayed with the trout people, but one year a trout swam too near the bank, and a fox grabbed that trout and ate it. And the story went into the fox people and was carried by many generations of foxes. And that's why the story has a quiet, sly wisdom. One year, there were spring rains and great floods. And the fox den was washed out and a young kit fox was trapped and drowned. And the story leached out of his bones into the earth. That's where the story would have remained, but a farmer came some years later and he plowed up that piece of, of earth and planted barley. And the barley pulled the story up by it through its roots with the water and it took it up into the seed heads of the barley and it made that barley especially sweet. And when they harvested that barley, they found it's the best barley for brewing ale. And so they planted more and more of that barley and made more and more ale over the years. In one year, Leslie and I and Brian and Madeline who shared a pint of ale and the story went into us and now we are you. Uh -huh.